Tonight on KQED Newsroom, embattled utility giant PG&E shakes up its leadership and a fight heats up over a center for the homeless in San Francisco. Also, the comeback of methamphetamine. The drug is causing an epidemic of deaths and emergency room visits in San Francisco. And a state lawmaker's quest to help millions of Californians clear old arrest and conviction records. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with PG&E's overhaul. The company has hired a longtime utility executive as CEO and is replacing most of its board of directors. The move comes after months of pressure from state officials and shareholders. The new chief executive and directors face a tough challenge, guiding the company through its restructuring in bankruptcy court and addressing increasing wildfire risks. Meanwhile, tough challenges for homeless advocates and the mayor of San Francisco as well. There's intense opposition to a proposed navigation center on the Embarcadero to shelter the homeless. Here now with a look at those stories and national political developments are Marisa Lagos, KQED's politics correspondent, Sean Walsh, Republican strategist with Wilson Walsh Consulting, and Dominic Fracasa, City Hall reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Let's start with PG&E. What do the appointments of the new CEO, Bill Johnson, and the new slate of board of directors tell us about the future direction of PG&E, Marisa? Well, I mean, I think it depends on who you ask. PG&E has framed the slate of directors that they proposed and this new CEO as, you know, uh, people that have expertise in safety that are really going to focus on the nuts and bolts of PG&E. Um, what critics are saying is that it looks like more of the same, that this is a, a bunch, 10 directors, many of whom do not have California ties, but have a lot of ties to Wall Street. Um, and I do think it's important to know, you know, how we've seen things progress in recent weeks. The stock of PG&E has gone up dramatically. They're mm -hmm. still in a Chapter 11 proceedings. Um, and, you know, We've seen a lot of pressure from the ratings agencies on Wall Street around trying to push Sacramento to change policies. Next week, the governor will be coming out with a set of proposals around utilities and wildfire generally. Um, and I think that this decision by PG&E to put this particular group of people and Bill Johnson in charge is really going to stoke the fire among people who already distrust this utility so much. Oh, and there's already criticism of Bill Johnson, right? Especially people now digging into the records and saying back when he was with Duke Energy, he was CEO there for less than a day and walked away with a $44 million severance package. That doesn't exactly instill uh, you know, confidence from members of the public. Well, you've got pg and &E executives that have walked away with millions of dollars in compensation packages after the last round of bankruptcies. That happens, and the irony is they're a regulated utility. So when they run short on cash, they go to the Public Utilities Commission and they get a guaranteed rate increase. So there's really no consequences from a financial and business perspective to these folks. There's some political consequences. I mean, honest to goodness. But are there really? I mean, I think that's an open question to your point. They have a guaranteed rate of return when they are paying out dividends. They know you know that that the state needs them and I think that that is why they're able to sort of buck everybody in California and say hey we don't we don't want to listen to you so, we'd so, rather listen to Wall Street okay so the shareholders are getting their dividends right but there are a lot of stakeholders in this we have also uh, you know lawmakers want to have a say we have wildfire victims how do you think all of this will play out Dominic I don't think you can look very far ahead at all with this I mean I think this guy was brought on uh, I believe it's the Tennessee Valley Authority mm -hmm. where, where he was coming from his financial bona fides were pretty sterling. I mean, from the reports Cut that I've read, there dramatically, he did yeah. he did well there financially for himself and for the authority itself. But I mean, this organization has to come out of Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and then it has to win back the public trust. And I mean, I think their their biggest challenge is winning over trust for 16 million customers who have seen in rapid succession, a number of pretty catastrophic problems at this organization, I mean, so at short yeah. term. I would just say that given how dire the straits are for PG&E, what we've seen in the past three years with these wildfires, it is pretty remarkable how much sort of leverage they still seem to be maintaining. Mm -hmm. And when you couple that with the other investor on utilities, which the state does not want to see enter Chapter 11, I have a hard time believing that anybody other than ratepayers and taxpayers are going to end up holding the bag. But some municipalities are, are, yeah. are starting to, to kind of fight back, right? San Francisco is looking at maybe taking over some of the assets, buying some of PG&E's assets, and establishing its own independent power system. <laughs> and, and there was a poll that came out this week about how San Francisco residents feel about that. That's right. So it's a very real possibility that San Francisco could buy up um, significant amounts of PG&E's uh, San Francisco assets. Now, 
the you know Byzantine nature of bankruptcy court will have a lot to say about that. But it's a very real possibility. And as you said, uh, this week um, the SFPUC put a poll in the field, and the results have come back. Uh, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission: 68% uh, of people, when fully briefed, fully explained on what. Uh, buying those assets would mean and might cost, which would be in the billions of dollars with a B, 68% were in support. And you're, But you're buying also assets that are, in some cases, over 100 years old. You've got a mm. bad infrastructure yeah. that is old that needs billions of dollars in uh, upgrades. Yeah. I think what's going to happen, the legislature is going to, in my view, overreach, and so they're going to probably mandate that they underground utilities uh, all throughout the state, which is enough, billions more, probably where they don't need to. Now, it's hard to say that to people that yeah. live in the North State who right. suffer those yeah. fires, but there are places where it's appropriate and places where they're not. So, again, once, once you get the legislature involved and then you get a guaranteed public utilities, the people holding the bag, as Marissa said, are the rate yeah. payers. Yeah. All right, obviously, much more to say on this, but I do want to also move on to a closely watched local issue, and that is this navigation center that Mayor Lyndon Breed wants to bring to the Embarcadero. She was at a community hearing on Wednesday, got shouted down, uh, clearly a lot of tensions over this. So, Dominate the City already has other navigation centers where homeless people can move in with their belongings, with their pets. Why is there so much tension over this particular site? I I don't think there's any two ways about it. I think it's the specific location of this site that has engendered the kind of reaction that we're seeing. It is on the Embarcadero. It says people like to say the city's front yard, not its backyard. Um, but I think that the reaction has been in part, what people will tell you is that we didn't hear about this from the mayor beforehand. We heard a fully baked proposal that was going to be voted on in a month. That's April 23rd is when the port commission is going to give this the thumbs up or down. And people felt like they were, they were not given any chance to have some input here. Now, on the other side of this equation are a lot of people in this city who look at homelessness as its singular, not singular, but its most pressing problem. Top and three. Top three, All three for of sure. Them. Yeah, homelessness, exactly. Homelessness, homelessness, homelessness. They're looking at this issue and they're saying people are living and dying on our streets and we need to get them inside. There is no problem that is not helped by having a roof over your head. And the idea of resisting the ability to put people inside a shelter is frankly repugnant to a lot of people in the city. But certainly there are those who are, are contending that, you know, this is an area that is visited not only by locals in San Francisco, but people from all over the Bay Area come to the Embarcadero with their families, with kids, and maybe... All over the uh, world. But all over the world. And are they not seeing homeless people now? I mean, I would say that one of the biggest complaints we get from the tourism board, from the Chamber of Commerce, is how visible and how upsetting this problem has become particularly downtown and in the Embarcadero area. And, you know, I think that that is the argument that proponents are making. And I think that this is really something we're going to see play out around the state. The governor's propose what half a billion mm. dollars for homeless shelters and these types of sort of triage places and you know it is one of those issues that I think everybody wants to solve but most people don't want to be personally you know take the burden on for and that Sean? is what the mayor said yeah. Yeah. well in fairness they're wraparound services I'd say they're more than triage that's how you're going to try and transition people into long-term stability but the issue is basic Generally, people don't want people in their backyards. People who have less income tend to fight things uh, less vigorously. If you put that thing near Nancy Pelosi's house or Diane Feinstein's house over by the Presidio, Presidio Heights, I bet you'd have the same kind of complaints from those neighborhoods as well. And the only thing I would say is that there is a growing consensus, I think, in the city. Maybe not a big one yet, but I think the message is out there that let's put them there, that we don't have a choice, that if there is space, this, this, is, this lot is city-owned. This, this lot can be built much more quickly, and the city already owns it, which is what makes yeah. it so attractive. The most important thing here that I think has engendered so much of the response is the one-to-one -one conflation, frankly, in the eyes of you know San Francisco homelessness officials at least, that homelessness equates to dirty, dangerous neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and that a shelter to house homeless people is going to ruin the neighborhood. That's where this comes from. All right, and the Port Commission will have the final say on this. We'll wait to see what they do. We have to move on to national politics as well. A lot to discuss today. A private lawyer for President Trump. Uh, told the Treasury Department to not release the president's tax returns, essentially saying House Democrats are abusing their power. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee is requesting six years of returns. Sean, is there any legal argument here that uh, Treasury uh, Secretary Steven Mnuchin could use to say, hey, you know what, nope, you can't have the returns? Yes, I would argue on both sides. Number one, it's authorized under law for Ways and Means. They shall turn those records over if they're requested. 
that said, they have to actually have a meaningful reason why they have to turn those records over. And as Senator Grassley put out in his letter uh, earlier in the week, they don't have that meaningful reason. You can't just do a fishing expedition and weaponize the IRS to attack Donald Trump or anybody else for that matter. So if they actually had a reason through any of their investigative work and their committees where they could prove that there was criminal activities done, well, then the I reason think they is have that a they say they want to chance. see how, how the auditing process uh, well, the, re the reason is the reason is is they didn't get him on the Mueller report, and they haven't gotten him on other issues. And so, I think this is a fishing expedition. Well, Nadler was riding up on the train to New York right after Donald Trump was elected, boasting on the Amtrak Acela what he was going to do and how he's going to go after Trump, and now he's living up to that uh, politics. I think. Certainly, Democrats would love this for political reasons. I think you cannot ignore the fact that we have a president who broke with modern precedent, who has maintained his business interest, whose sons are still controlling those businesses. And he's the and only president are, since Nixon. Right, who and who has done this. And there returns. are very legitimate questions about whether the president is using his office to enrich himself and his family and friends. And I think that that is the argument Democrats are trying to make. I think the argument that Republicans will make in the president is what exactly what Sean laid out and I think this will end up in court. All right, I want to talk about the subpoena as well. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee voted this week to approve a subpoena to try to make Attorney General William Barr release the full Mueller report. No word yet on if or when that subpoena will be used, but but Dominic, do the Democrats risk a backlash here by continuing to hammer away at this issue instead of just moving on to maybe e economic issues? Maybe so. Maybe so. I mean, I think there will be some sort of tipping point at which, and I, and I don't think it'll, uh, uh, I don't think it's very far away at which it starts to feed into the witch hunt narrative. Um, I am curious about what congressional Democrats feel that they can get out of uh, this information that Bob Mueller and his team did not. I think that's a legitimate question, regardless of politics here. I mean, what 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 exactly are these subpoenas going to find that Bob Mueller has, hasn't? I mean, I think the question is, did was Barr's summation of the report accurate as well, right? And so we sure. don't know what we don't know, but I think Dominic's right. If we don't know more sooner, then it could but, but, be a tipping in, point. In fairness, so the Democrats screamed bloody murder for two years. Give the man time. If anybody goes to try and slow or shut down this investigation, we're going to take action, right? The report's been back to bar for a, you know a little over a yeah. week, and all of a sudden we got to issue subpoenas to get it out tomorrow. It's, it's, it's this, is, this is not the last we're going to hear of it for sure. Sean Walsh, Marisa Lagos, and Dominic Fracasa, thank you all. Now to the growing epidemic of methamphetamine abuse. Since 2011, deaths related to meth use have doubled in San Francisco, while emergency room visits have increased sixfold. Meth is now considered a public health crisis in San Francisco. Last year, nearly half the visits to the psychiatric emergency room at San Francisco General Hospital were made by people high on meth. In February, San Francisco Mayor London Breed and Supervisor Rafael Mandelman announced a task force to combat the spike in meth use. Joining me now to discuss Meth's comeback and its history in California is KQED health correspondent April Demboski. April, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Twee. So obviously a big problem in San Francisco, meth use. How widespread is the, the epidemic outside of San Francisco? Uh, it really varies from region to region. Uh, in general, what we're seeing is a rise in stimulant use as opposed to the opioid epidemic that we've been hearing about. And because of different drug distribution networks, we see more cocaine and uh, PCP on the East Coast, uh, but meth is much bigger in the West. Mm -hmm. um, so besides San Francisco, it's really big in Los Angeles. Um, there's also pockets in Denver and uh, uh, growing in Texas as well. So within the Pacific, within the West and the Midwest, 70% of local law enforcement agencies say meth is their biggest drug threat. 70%? 70%. That is enormous. Uh, and, and you interviewed a number of meth addicts. Why do they take the drug and what has it done to their lives? Well, at first, uh, meth can give you a really euphoric feeling. It makes you happy. It makes you confident. I talked to a number of women who use meth and um, they talk about how it's really energetic, it makes you productive, and a surprising number of them talk about using meth while they clean the house. Mm. Um, it also makes you lose weight, um, and it can also give you a heightened sex drive. So but those are the reasons. when it starts to wear off. So, but then when it wears off, I mean, it, that's when the trouble begins. It can make you feel tweaky is the word that people say, like anxious, and if you use it over time, um, there's just, and really get addicted, there's just utter destruction 
And, 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 and as I was reading some of the stuff that you've reported, and, and sometimes it um, drives them to commit crimes. They, they do crazy things, like they think someone is after them. They end up in people's homes. They're breaking into people's homes. It can make you feel really paranoid, and that's one of the reasons that the visits at psychiatric emergency at the local hospital are so high, um, that people come in and they actually, you actually can't tell the difference between someone um, who is really high on meth is called meth-induced psychosis, and someone who has chronic schizophrenia. They look the same. You know, I remember covering um, the meth epidemic in the early 2000s, right, when there, there were all these homegrown meth labs because you could find the in ingredients in decongestants in the drugstore. And then Congress cracked down on it. It went away. Why is meth making a comeback now? Well, you know, it, they left a void, but someone was going to come in and fill it because people are still willing to buy drugs. So um, Mexican cartels uh, moved into the void. And so a lot of meth is made in Mexico, but still then sort of brought to Los Angeles, which is um, one of the sort of distribution centers for the rest of the country. And then it's become very cheap, very pure and cheap, about $5 a hit. Exactly. So that's one of the reasons that it people are people are buying it. And you mentioned at the top how a lot of attention has been paid to the opioid crisis. And in fact, there are three FDA approved treatments for opioid addiction, and yet there's nothing for meth. Why is that? Um, it's, it's really uh, has to do with the science. Um, you know, in the brain, there are opioid receptors. And so that these drugs that have been developed target those specific receptors. But when you use meth, it, it really affects the entire brain. And so mm -hmm. there isn't really anything that scientists can use to to, to go zero in on something directly. Um, lots of things have been tried. I mean, there have been lots of trials for different antidepressants, antipsychotics, but nothing has made it through um, a full-scale clinical trial. So we're left with behavioral treatments. And behavioral treatments in our healthcare system are difficult. They take a long time. They're expensive. And there's some innovation on that front. Right here in our own backyard, you interviewed a researcher at Stanford who is studying why some meth addicts are particularly susceptible to relapse. And what has she found, and how do you think that would help with future treatments for meth addicts? Right, so um, under conventional treatments, conventional rehabs, 60% um, of meth users are, will end up relapsing within a year. And so um, some scientists at Stanford are studying specific parts of the brain and um, looking at, at at MRIs while people look at pictures of drugs that um, kind of stimulate their interest. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really interesting. They've found that um, there is a very specific part of the brain that lights up. And um, so in discovering this, they're hoping that that will lead to more directed treatments down the line. But for now, like you said, behavioral therapy, is that, is that what they're having to rely on? Counseling, and are there certain incentives that seem to work with addicts? So, um, so there is something called contingency management, which is an incentive-based program. And basically, um, and there's a program in San Francisco that does this, you have people come in three times a week, they pee in a cup, take a test, and every time they test negative for meth, they get paid. So maybe it starts out as $2, it goes up to $10 over the course of 12 weeks. And it works. works, it works. I mean, we use it for weight loss. Uh, you know, it's the same kinds of things that are used to um, teach children how to behave. Mm. Um, but, you know, that's not a popular thing. You can imagine taxpayers not liking the idea of our state programs paying drug users to not use drugs. So most insurers don't cover it. What do you think is the biggest challenge for public health officials right now in trying to address this epidemic? Well, I think there are a couple things. You know, I mean, the opioid epidemic is, is serious and it is unprecedented, the numbers of people who are overdosing from opioids. And so from a sort of public perspective, when somebody ODs on opioids, they're kind of passed out on the sidewalk. But when someone has used too much meth, um, you get that paranoia, and you get so the psychosis. you get the psychosis. You have people maybe running out into the middle of the street, uh, disrupting traffic. So it's more of a, a public nuisance, if you will. And um, so I think that it it kind of disrupts uh, society in a different way. You know, even though deaths have really gone up, the sort of absolute number of deaths 
are not nearly the same as opioids, and that has made it really difficult to get more attention on this, more money, more resources. April Domboski, KQED Health Correspondent, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And you can hear April's KQED radio documentary on the meth epidemic at www.californiareport.org. Turning now to state politics, California could soon clear the criminal records of millions of people under a proposed bill that would automate the process for eligible arrests and convictions. State Assembly Member Phil Ting of San Francisco authored the measure, believed to be the first of its kind in the nation. An old arrest or conviction record can be a major barrier to finding work, housing or public benefits. Roughly 8 million Californians could get relief under the bill without having to pay any money or petition state courts. Assemblymember Phil Ting joins me now to discuss this and other legislative priorities. He chairs the Budget Committee in the State Assembly. Nice to have you back. Thanks, Tui. Thanks for having me. I'll get to your legislation in just a moment, but first I'd like to ask you about PG&E's shakeup of its board of directors and also the appointment of a new CEO. Your thoughts? Well, I think we're very concerned because the board's been taken over by a number of hedge fund folks who seem like they have the interest of money over the interest of the uh, ratepayers all across Northern California. So we want to make sure that as PG&E goes through bankruptcy that you have an entity, an organization that is really going to come out of it that's going to really serve the ratepayers better. Do you think the new slate of leaders will do that? I, I think, I think we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Uh, let's talk about your criminal justice bill. Uh, the crimes that are eligible to be wiped out once people have served their mm -hmm. times under this bill are misdemeanors or low-level felonies mm -hmm. like burglaries mm -hmm. or uh, drug offenses. Why do you feel it's necessary to do this? Well, so, so right now, millions of Californians, there are 8 million Californians who have a conviction or an arrest record. And underneath that, there are millions of Californians who already are eligible to have their records cleared. Mm -hmm. So many times you can get arrested and you're never actually convicted of anything, but that stays on your record. And if you apply for a job, you apply for housing, you might have to answer questions about some very minor conviction. So what we know is that with these, for these millions of Californians, it's hard for them to get employment, hard for them to get housing. So if we can really automate that system, right now they, they can go clear that record, but it takes time, hiring a lawyer, going to court. Takes so money. Takes as money. As $150. That, that's right, that's right. So what we want to do is really streamline government, have the attorney general's office do it, have one database which they would get to the courts, and then the courts could just say, that information is being withheld. Some criminal justice advocates, though, think that you could have gone farther, maybe perhaps follow the example of Colorado, uh, which authorizes the courts to automatically seal the records of people acquitted of charges yes. or um, acquitted at trial or whose charges were dismissed. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that approach? So, so we tried that approach last year, and we couldn't get it out of appropriations because of the huge cost, and because the courts came in and said that was it was very difficult to do. They had to spend a lot of time, money, and effort. So we did want to take a step back, look at a look at a you know a process that was a little cheaper and a little more streamlined. And this mm -hmm. way, you have one party who does it. That way, it's consistent all around the state. They send it to the 58 counties, and then the counties just withhold that information. Let's talk about the college admission scandal as well, because you have some legislation there. Uh, the way things stand now, 13 Bay Area parents are among those charged, including an entrepreneur from mm -hmm. Menlo Park who indicated this week that he will be among the first to plead mm -hmm. guilty. Uh, you authored a bill in response to the scandal right. as part of a series of reform bills that other lawmakers have signed on to. What would your measure do? So, so this measure really deals with the legal backdoor that people are coming into elite universities in, which is really dealing with donors and uh, alumni. So right now you have many elite universities, they reserve a backdoor, an express lane of sorts, for people who donate or alumni. So USC, they get $21 million in Cal grants, which is a grant that the state gives to low-income students who go to USC. But they reserve 19% of their slots for donors and alumni. So again, for children of donors and alumni. For, for children of donors and alumni, right. And so what we want to do is say, if you take the $21 million, if you take the money from the state, you really shouldn't show any preference for donors or alumni. You, we should just have one front door where everyone gets admitted and gets evaluated. How would you go about monitoring that, though? Well, the same way, once you pass laws, you'd have to do some follow-up and making sure that they actually do amend their policies. But they, they at first would have to do it on their own. So you're, you're trusting them to do it. It's sort of on the merit system at first. You know, initially, but then obviously we would do follow-up oversight. We would have to get, uh, do hearings to really understand what the data is. And that's one of the big challenges right now. There isn't a lot of published data. 
they're private institutions, so they keep all that information to themselves. So, so one start would actually be to get more information, more data to really understand how prevalent this is. In fact, that 19% is really not published anywhere on their website. We found that information via blog that was reported in a news article. I hear you're also a big fan of long receipts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you have a bill out. Yes. I'm joking. You have a bill out that uh, proposes barring retailers from giving out printed receipts unless the customer asks right. for them. We, we've all gotten those long CVS yes, yes, receipts. Yes. Uh, but what else are you working on these days? What's your priority now in terms of upcoming legislation? Well, well that is one of our, our major priorities, really, uh, AB uh, 191, which is dealing with uh, e-receipts. We want people to actually be able to offer digital receipts first after 2022, and then for people who want paper receipts, they, they can just ask for them. That's, to us, very important. It's yeah. something that is a for good option. For the environment. For the environment, yes. And, but what about your upcoming priorities? Do you have other legislation that you're working on? What's coming down the pipeline for you? A absolutely, I've uh, two major pieces of housing legislation, one around accessory dwelling units, and the other uh, around surplus public land. We have a housing crisis really up and down the state. This would uh, really ensure that when you have surplus public land, it gets offered to affordable housing developers first. With accessory dwelling units, or otherwise known as in-law units or granny flats, this would streamline the process throughout the state. Right now, you have so uh, you have a lot of cities, especially wealthy suburban communities, they don't want in-laws built on these big lots, so they, they pretty much have banned them. But in-laws are a fast, affordable way to get affordable housing into communities. You chair the Assembly Budget Committee, and we know that Governor Newsom's one hundred forty-four billion dollar budget that he unveiled in January invests heavily in, in health care mm -hmm. and early childhood education. Uh, which you support. Mm -hmm. Are there certain provisions of this budget, though, that you feel you might have some trouble backing? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, uh, you know, overall, the, the broad vision of the budget we're very supportive of. And what we're doing is getting into the details. So, for example, he's got a proposal on housing and homelessness. Does, does things a little bit differently than we've done in the past, so we're trying to reconcile that with you know what we did in the past, what works, and really what's yeah. good. Uh, we also want to take a look at the early education pieces. I think we're very supportive overall, but I think there'll be some tinkering okay. with where exactly the money goes. All right, Assemblyman Phil Ting, thank you for coming in and sharing with us your legislative priorities. Thanks for having me, Tui. And that will do it for us. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.